Each of the four major factions in Zelda Tears of the Kingdom has a legendary armament, once wielded by their champion. This compilation video will cover how to get all four and how to repair them cheaply so they never break. As usual, useful timestamps can be found in the video description. The first part of this video is actually going to be about getting diamonds since we will need a grand total of 13 diamonds to forge the legendary arms from all four factions. The first way to get diamonds is through the rare ore deposits. You can create a manual save, then break the ore deposit. If it doesn't give you a diamond, then you can reload the save and try again, and keep doing that until you get a diamond. I did this with two rare ore deposits and it took about 4 minutes to get a diamond from each. You can also get diamonds from Gon Goron at the center of Goron City. He will sell 3 diamonds per day. However, they are 1000 rupees each and he will only sell them once you've completed the main quest in Goron City. In addition, Stone Talus bosses also have a small chance of dropping a diamond when defeated, and there are tons of those located throughout the depths. The last option is to go to specific locations with guaranteed diamonds and we'll cover 7 of them. The first is in Hyrule Castle. Glide north from Lookout Landing Skyview Tower and land on the balcony overlooking the outer gate. Once there, find and open the metal grate and drop down to find this diamond. The second diamond is located within the Jinno Dock Shrine. I got to it by using the Hyrule Field Skyview Tower, then outfitting a nearby floating platform with rockets, but fans would work as well. All that's left is to retrieve the Shrine Crystal, which you can do pretty easily by rotating this platform to bridge the two islands. Diamond number 3 is located in the Mauika Shrine, southwest of the Upland Zorana Skyview Tower. It's within a cave and the easiest way to reach it is by landing on top of the cave, then entering through the giant skull. The shrine is to the north once you drop in. The fourth diamond is at the Yomazuke Shrine. This shrine is located within a cave on the east coast of Hyrule. The cave's entrance is on the south side of Lodrum Headland near Tarn Point. Drop in and find your way across the waterlogged cave to reach this shrine. The fifth diamond is in the Jochi Ihiga Shrine near Terrytown. To open this shrine, you will need to haggle and eventually buy the corresponding shrine crystal off of Hagi in Terry Town. You will then need to use your ingenuity to ferry the crystal across the water. For my part, I used a flying machine to do it. The next diamond is in Gano's Shrine, up in the sky and north from the Gerudo Highland Skyview Tower. Accessing this tower for the first time will require going through the nearby cave, floating down the stream on a plank of wood, and ascending through the bottom of the tower. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it, but let's just say that all the floating platforms and rockets you'll need to reach the shrine are provided around the floating islands of the North Gerudo Sky Archipelago, and it's a pretty fun trek to make if you haven't done it yet. Once there, you'll need to either defeat a Flux Construct 3 or at least steal the Shrine Crystal from it. Fortunately, a flying machine and some batteries are both provided so that anyone can get the crystal back up to the Shrine. 
The seventh and last diamond is in the shrine on Valor Island, floating high over Lanairu Mountain. You can reach Valor Island fairly easily from Mount Lanairu Skyview Tower. Once in the air, you can start gliding northeast towards Valor Island. However, it is going to be out of reach for most people unless you stop at a small nearby island. There, you'll find a pre-built Zonai flying machine that will provide more than enough mobility to reach Valor Island. Once there, speak with the steward construct and complete his skydiving challenge to gain access to the shrine and final diamond. Given that we only have 7 guaranteed diamonds and we need 13 in total, you will have to prioritize which legendary arms you want to get first. Because of that, I organized the weapons based on their usefulness and whether they have good alternatives. We will start with one of the easiest to get and which provides the highest damage output, the light scale trident. To get the light scale trident, you will need to speak with Dento in Zora's domain, located to the east. He can be found next to the general store. You'll need to complete the main quest in Zora's domain where you help to clear the sludge from the surrounding waters before Dento will offer to craft you the light scale trident. Once he does, this will start the quest Glory of the Zora, where we will need to gather the required materials for making the legendary trident. Those materials are 5 flint, 3 diamonds, and 1 Zora spear. The first material, flint, is super easy to find. Just break any mineral deposits you see in caves and you are bound to find it. In fact, the chances are very high that you already have well over 5 flint unless you've been selling it. You will also need the 3 diamonds, which we've already covered. The last material we need is a Zora spear, and it can be either the gloom corroded or sparkling variety. I know of two guaranteed locations for Zora Spears. The first is right next to Upland Zorana Skyview Tower. There, a Zora is trapped in muck. If you free him, he will give you a Zora Spear as a reward. The second guaranteed Zora Spear is a short distance to the south of the Skyview Tower near Rallis Pond. You'll find a chest to the west of the pond containing this spear. If you've already gotten and broken those Zora Spears, you do have other options. The first is the like enemies found in many caves. They always drop one or two weapons when defeated. So you can go to a cave, preferably one in Zora's domain, and save before defeating one of these enemies. If it doesn't drop the Zora Spear, you can reload the last save and defeat it again. You can keep doing this until you get a Zora Spear. The other option is to go look for one in the depths. Specifically, there are two paths that carve through the depths beneath Zora's domain, and they are lined with Zora statues. One of these paths starts at the bottom of the Lanairu Wetlands Chasm. and the other starts at the bottom of the East Hill Chasm. Both paths converge at the abandoned Lanairu Mine. Along these paths are plenty of shadow figures standing on raised stone platforms, each holding a sparkling weapon. These shadow figures are scattered all over the depths, but many of those along the Zora paths carry spears, and those spears are frequently Zora spears. Following these two paths, I was able to find a total of four Zora Spears and I marked them on my map with sword stamps. While those specific shadow figures might not be holding Zora Spears in your world, you will most likely find at least one shadow figure that is holding a Zora Spear while going along those paths. Once you have all the required materials, head back to Dento to craft the Trident. The Light Scale Trident has a base attack power of 22 damage. However, its intrinsic trait will have it dealing double damage whenever you are wet, and that bonus extends to any material fused to it. With the Silver Lionel Saberhorn fused to the Light Scale Trident, it has a total attack power of 154 whenever wet. 
At the risk of a minor spoiler, Sidon's Sage ability will give you the wet status for around 1 minute. Given that the cooldown on his ability is less than 10 seconds, it is very easy and practical to have the wet status in any and all combat encounters. If you need high attack power fuse materials, I have a whole guide on how to get them and I will link it near the bottom of this video's description. In addition to its very high damage potential, this trident is as tough as the diamonds it was made with. I was able to mow through an entire village of black and silver tier enemies without it breaking or becoming badly damaged. It is essentially the Hylian shield of weapons. If it does break, or if you otherwise lose it, then Dento will craft another for you, assuming you can bring him the same materials. That being said, it is much easier to repair this weapon through the Rock Octorox near Death Mountain using a simple trick. We'll cover this cheaper method of repairing legendary weapons near the end of this video once we've covered the other legendary arms. The next set of arms are the Scimitar of the Seven along with its pairing shield, Daybreaker. Once again, this is totally worth making. Before being able to make this legendary set, you'll need to do two things. The first is to complete the side quest, The Missing Owner. This quest is given by Kara in Gerudo Town. If you haven't completed the main quest in this region, Kara will be located down in the town shelter, which you can initially gain access to via the water well near the town's entrance. Just make your way through until you reach the main stream where bottled messages are floating along. Swim upstream until you are under the town shrine and use Ascend to gain access. You'll find Kara selling jewelry nearby, and if you haven't already, this will start you on the main quest in the Gerudo Desert. This is well and good because you will need to complete the main quest here before being able to get the Scimitar of the Seven. If you've already done that, then you will find Kara at the jewelry shop in the town square. After getting the quest from Kara, make your way out west to the Taruma Dunes. Here, you'll have to save Isha from a Molduga. You can bait the Molduga out from the sand by throwing basically anything onto the sand in front of its path. If you time it right, you can even get the Molduga to eat a time bomb. In any case, once it's out and on the sand, stab it in the belly, which is its weak spot. After saving Isha, she will return to Gerudo Town, leaving you to pick up the loot. If you are lucky enough to get either a Gerudo Shield or a Gerudo Scimitar, keep it and don't break it as we will need it soon. Once you've completed the main quest in this area, you can return to Kara and Isha by the jewelry shop. The reward for saving Isha is one diamond, which is great because we are going to need it. When you speak with Isha again, she will offer to make the Scimitar of the Seven and the Daybreaker Shield. In exchange, you'll need to cough up 10 flint, 4 diamonds, a Gerudo Shield, and a Gerudo Scimitar. For the shield, let's go to the West Gerudo Underground Ruins. It is far northwest of Gerudo Town, beneath a giant ribcage. Save the game as soon as you get there as we will have our opportunity for a Gerudo Shield. You may notice the electric-like enemy nearby. When defeated, it will drop a chest with a high probability of containing a Gerudo shield. You can create a manual save before fighting it, and reload the save if you don't get the shield to try again. I think it has a high probability of dropping a shield though as I got it on my first try. There is a small hole in the ground nearby and you can throw a bomb in there or use a blunt weapon to break the rock beneath it, revealing an entrance to the underground ruins. I encourage you to explore this location on your own time as it has another unique item at the end of it, but it isn't necessary for this guide. For the Gerudo Scimitar, head back to the Lightning Temple and run down the first corridor. Besides this Scimitar, we will just need 10 flint and 4 diamonds. We already covered the diamonds and flint can be obtained by breaking any ore deposit or rock.
Once you reach the first intersection, turn right and go into the next room. The floor should begin dropping. Follow it down to the pit and take out the keys. Then use Ultra Hand to remove this slab from on top of the nearby sarcophagus. You'll find a Gerudo scimitar inside, and the nice thing about this scimitar is that it will respawn every blood moon. Once you have all the required materials, return to Isha and she will craft the legendary arms of Champion Urbosa. If you ask me, the Daybreaker shield is good, but not better than the Hylian shield. The scimitar of the Seven, on the other hand, is great. It has a base attack power of 28 damage, however, its intrinsic trait doubles the attack power of any material fused to it. With the Silver Lionel Saberhorn fused to the scimitar, it has a total attack power of 138 at all times. In addition to its very high damage potential, the scimitar is extremely durable. I was able to mow through four and a half of the five Lionels at the Floating Colosseum before it finally became badly damaged. If the scimitar does break, or you otherwise lose it, then Isha will craft another for you in exchange for three diamonds, five flint, and one Gerudo scimitar. The Daybreaker shield will take one diamond, five flint, and one Gerudo shield to replace. That being said, we will go over a much cheaper way to repair either of these near the end of this video. We will next go for the Great Eagle Bow. Before getting this bow, you will first need to complete the entire main quest in Rito Village. Once you've done that, you can find Taba near the village's highest point. Speak with him to start the Legacy of the Rito quest, which tasks you with gathering up the materials to craft the Great Eagle Bow. Specifically, we will need one swallow bow, five bundles of wood, and three diamonds. The wood is easy, chop down trees, and the swallow bow is also very easy to get. From the Rose Pro Pass Skyview Tower, run a short distance west and jump down to the hut near the flight range. There, a swallow bow is leaning against the wall near Canelli. After speaking with Canelli, you can grab the bow. Even if you've already taken and used this bow up to its breaking point, it should respawn with the next Blood Moon. You will also need the three diamonds, which we've already covered. Once you've collected all the necessary materials, return to Taba to have the bow crafted. As far as bows go, it's very nice. It's a tri-shot bow with 28 damage per projectile, fast draw speed, a very straight arrow trajectory, and can fire about 65 shots before breaking. All that considered, it is only marginally better than the Savage Lionel bow, which has a considerably slower rate of fire, but those are much easier to get. In any case, if the Great Eagle bow breaks, Taba can craft another if you bring him the same materials. Don't do that though, as we will soon cover how to cheaply repair any legendary weapon right after we get the last legendary weapon, the Boulder Breaker. Before getting this sword, you'll need to complete the entire main quest in Goron City. Once you have, you can speak with Fugo and Rohan in the northern part of the city. This will start the Soul of the Goron side quest, which tasks you with collecting the materials needed to make the Boulder Breaker. Those being a Cobble Crusher, 5 flint, and 3 diamonds. The flint is easy and you get plenty of it from breaking through rocks and basically any ore deposit. There are lots of cobble crushers held within chests in the surrounding areas, but they do not respawn if you've already gotten them. The closest one is a short distance south of Goron City, up on a small ledge. Two more can be found near the cart track running along the south side of Death Mountain, and each of these is in a chest guarded by Bokoblins. A final Cobble Crusher can be found to the west of Elden Canyon Skyview Tower, also in a Bokoblin camp.
I have also found a Bospo Coblin that always seems to carry a Cobble Crusher, and he respawns every Blood Moon just south of the Mississi Light Route in the depths beneath Death Mountain. We also need the three diamonds, which we've already covered. Once you have all of the required materials, return to Fugo in Goron City, and he will happily craft the Boulder Breaker for you. This sword is remarkably similar to the Fierce Deity Sword. Both are two-handed, with 38 base attack power and equal durability. The only major difference between the two is that the Boulder Breaker has the Demolisher trait, which causes it to behave like a mace rather than a sword. This trait instantly becomes moot if you fuse a material to the Boulder Breaker, as it then takes on the weapon characteristics of that material. And you will want to fuse a material to it, as the Boulder Breaker's base durability is mediocre at best. I was really hoping that the Boulder Breaker would take no damage from breaking rocks or deposits of ore, as then it would have earned a welcomed spot in my arsenal. Instead, it will probably just end up on a weapon rack in my house near Terrytown. That being said, if you do end up using the Boulder Breaker to its breaking point or otherwise lose it, then Fugo will make another for you given the same materials as the first time around. However, it is much easier to repair the sword through the Rock Octorox near Death Mountain using a simple trick. We will now cover how to cheaply repair any legendary weapon. And while we will be using the Boulder Breaker in this example, you can do this with any legendary weapon, shield, or bow. First, if you want to recover any material fused to the Boulder Breaker, bring it to the Break Apart shop in Terrytown, and pay 20 rupees to have the material safely parted from the sword. Next, bring the Boulder Breaker and a basic weapon, such as a sturdy stick, to a Rock Octorok. I marked the location of around 20 near Death Mountain on my map. I like going to the Momosik Shrine because there are three Octoroks near it. To repair a normal weapon, all you need to do is drop it in front of a Rock Octorok. It will inhale it, repairing and even upgrading it before violently spitting it back at you. However, the Boulder Breaker is considered a legendary weapon, and the Rock Octorok will reject it and spit it back out immediately without repairing it. So we need to trick them into doing it. The way to do this is by dropping the Boulder Breaker on the ground and fusing it to a non-legendary weapon or shield, in our case a sturdy stick. Then drop the stick with a sword fused to it in front of the Octorok. Doing that, the Rock Octorok will then repair and upgrade the stick, or any other non-legendary weapon, and the fused weapon, the Boulder Breaker, will also be repaired. It just won't be given any upgrade. As a final note, if you need to do this again, know that a given Octorok will only repair one item per Blood Moon, so you'll need to go to a different Octorok if you need more repairs before then. The last step is to bring the item with the Boulder Breaker fused to it to the Break Apart Shop in Terrytown. Pay a 20 rupee fee to safely unfuse the Boulder Breaker and recover it in fully repaired condition. If you want to see more great guides, you can head over to my channel, and if you're new, consider subscribing. You're helping me feed my cat, her name's Marshmallow. Have a great day, if you're here today, have a great Monday, and a great week, and as always, thanks for watching.